Good morning. Here it is Sunday morning again. And I want to say, as I always say before I begin in our teaching, that I am very thankful that you allow me to have this time to come into your home or wherever you may be watching or watching throughout the week. And it is my desire that God will use me this morning in order to bring you a fresh, dynamic word from God. I believe the Lord does have a specific word for us today, and I do believe that God is going to talk to many of us here this morning, and we're going to receive fresh revelation as to what we are to do, what God expects us to do. Now, with that said, without any further ado, we're going to get right into the Word of God. There's two places that we're going to go. First of all, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, we're going to read verse 22 down to verse 28. And then we will go to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. But right now, though, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 32, beginning with verse 28 through the verse 20, or the, the verse 22 down to the verse 28. And we're going to be reading out of the Voice Bible. And this is what it says. Later that same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the Jabbok River. He sent them all ahead across the stream along with everything he had. Now I want you to pay close attention to what it just said. He sent them all ahead across the stream along with everything he had. But Jacob stayed behind, left alone in his distress and doubt. In the twilight of his anguish, an unknown man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw he was not winning the battle with Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was thrown out of joint as he continued to wrestle with with him. The angel of the Lord said, let me go, the dawn is breaking. But I want you to notice what Jacob said. I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? He tells him, Jacob. Then the angel of God says, you will no longer go by the name of Jacob. For from now on, your name will be Israel. Watch this. Because you have wrestled with God and humanity, and you have prevailed. I want to draw your attention. I want you to take special note of what it had just said. From now on, your name will be Israel because you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. Now, we are going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. I'm going to read it out of my Jewish Bible. This is what it says. From the days of John the Immerser until now, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence and shares in the heavenly kingdom are sought for with the most ordinate zeal and the most intense exertion and violent men seizing it each one claiming eagerly for himself. I want to read that again. From the days of John the Immerser until now, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence, or the King James Version says, taken by force, and shares in the heavenly kingdom are sought for with the most ordinate zeal and the most intense exertion. And violent men are seizing it, each one claiming eagerly for himself. Now, if I was to give this a title for this teaching this morning, it will be, maybe it's time for a wrestling match. Maybe it's time for a wrestling match. The word suffereth there, in the King James Version it says, and the the kingdom of God suffers violence. The word suffers there has numerous interpretations, which are, it is vital. When you look it up in the uh, Greek, it will tell you it is a vital 
activity. It is absolute necessary. It is a mandatory activity. It also means to crowd oneself into. It means to take hold of eagerly and decisively. It's not something that is taken in a haphazard way. But once again, the Greek meaning to take hold of eagerly and decisively. It is, I repeat, a vital, absolute necessary activity that must take place. Now, it has been said, unless you enter the beehive, you can't take the honey. I'll say that again. It has been said and then written down, unless you enter the beehive, you cannot take hold of the honey. You see, here's my point. You can only accomplish in proportion to what you attempt. The reason so little is accomplished is generally because so little is attempted. It's not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. Procrastination causes things to become difficult. Yes, it does. It's dilly-dallying around. It's putting off intentionally the doing of something that should and ought to be done. You can't steal second base and keep your foot on first, somebody wrote. I'll say that again because I read this statement many years ago. And so while I was studying this past Thursday, I ran across it again. You can't steal second base and keep your foot on first. You see, as kingdom citizens, we can't sit back and take what comes. What do we do? You have to go after it. I repeat, you have to go after it. You have to get aggressive and go after God. The door of spiritual opportunity won't open unless we push. Albert Herbert said this, People who want milk should not sit themselves on a stool in the middle of the field and hope that the cow will back up to them. I'll repeat that again. Albert Hubert said, People who want milk should not sit themselves on a stool in the middle of a field and hope that the cow will back up to them. See, I want you to listen. This is I'm setting a groundwork for what we're going to be given you. In 50 years of my ministry, there is one major thing that I have learned. You have to get spiritually aggressive. Yes, you do. You have to be more than willing to fight. You have to be more than willing to stand. You have to be willing more than to where you do not move one inch. To where you have to be willing to just hang on to be relentless, to be unstoppable, to be incessant, to be tenacious, to show great effort without giving up. You have to be unshakable. And so I must repeat that again because it is imperative that we get a hold of this foundation that is going to move us into a deeper revelation this morning. But as I said, you have to get spiritually aggressive. That's what I have learned. In 50 years of ministry, you have to be more than willing to fight. Yes, you do. You have to be more than willing to take a stand, to not move one inch, to hang on, to be relentless, to be unstoppable, to be incessant, to be tenacious, to show great effort without giving up, and to be simply unshakable. You see, there is no excuse for being full of excuses. No, it's not. 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. You'll find that when we become good at making excuses, we won't be good at anything else. Excuses are the tools a person with no purpose or vision uses to build a great monument 
of emptiness. I'll say it again. Excuses are the tools a person with no purpose or vision uses to build great monuments of emptiness. I say many times when I am behind this desk, that is it possible that I am speaking to somebody or maybe several of you that have been making excuses as to why you cannot be great in the kingdom of God or why you cannot live for God or why this or why that. And so once again, it is you that I want to talk to right now that 99% of failures come from people who have made it a habit of making excuses. You see, I have always said excuses are nails to build a house of failure. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, God will not excuse excuses. I'll say that again. When it comes to the kingdom of God, God will not excuse excuses. No, sir. We find in the New Testament to where the call was given out to come to the banquet. But there, there were many that found an excuse. And when it came time for the wedding to, to the wedding banquet to begin, the door was shut. You see, there's going to come a time when God will shut the door to excuses. And that when we finally do make up our mind, it could be too late. And so that's why I am encouraging somebody right now. Stop making excuses. Stop being full of excuses. Because the enemy will always ex give you an excuse to not do something. Somebody said one time, if you find an excuse, don't pick it up. But oh my Lord, that's what I'm feeling right now. That somebody has been making excuses as to why you cannot do the things that God has called you to do. And so God is moving upon me to reach you now to get rid of the excuses. The, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. God has said in his word, Paul said it, that we have been given the ability of God. You have the ability of God. But you have been listening to voices. You have been listening to voices that has caused you to make you think, make you believe that you can't do it. But you can do it. All you have to do is set your mind to do it. That's all it takes. It's a determination that I'm going to stop using excuses. God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose in, his, in your life for you. Yes, he does. It's never too late. To begin again with God. It's never too late. To begin again with God. I'll say it again. It's never too late. To begin again with God. Now let us continue. It says. I've already said this. Excuses are the tools. A person with no purpose or vision. Uses to build great monuments. Of emptiness. Florence Nightingale said. I attribute my success. To this. I never gave or took an excuse. When it comes to speaking and standing on God's word, I am relentless. Yes, I am. For me, there are no zero excuses. There is nothing, no excuses at all. But in my standing on God's word, I have learned from time to time, I've had to wrestle in prayer for an answer. I've had to grapple with God in prayer. It became the moment of desperation. I want you to hear this. Within that prayer, for me, it was do or die. You see, this is what needs to be understood. Some victories don't come easily. Some breakthroughs don't happen as quickly. There has to be a wrestling. We have to grapple with God. This is what happened to Jacob at Jabbok. It was do or die time for him. He sent his family on ahead of him. And he stayed behind. The voice Bible says 
He was left alone in his distress and doubt. In the twilight of his anguish, suddenly he finds himself in a fight. It was the time when mortal man had a wrestling match with an eternal God. All night long, he grappled with God. This wrestling match pushed his determination into a spiritual dimension that he had never been before. I want to say that again. This wrestling match pushed Jacob's determination into a spiritual dimension as never before. That wrestling match became what I call the tipping point in Jacob's life. It became the crucial point which a significant and unstoppable change took place. You see, that's what a tipping point means. When you look it up, it means the crucial point. Notice now, it's a crucial time, a crucial point, which a significant and unstoppable change takes place. It's the time during an activity or process when an important decision has been made and the situation changes completely. Jacob, he sent his family ahead. He was left alone. You see, there comes a time that you have got to get away from the clamor. You got to get away from the shout. You got to get away from the crowd. And you have to get alone with God. And there has to be a mindset of determination when you get alone with God that you feel like for you it is the time of do or die. You see, I remember when I was in my home church, we had a large youth group. And many times after Sunday night service, we would all go out to eat. But there was one particular day, Bishop Davis knew that God had his hand on me. And on this particular day, he and I began to talk about being used of God. And suddenly, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, Son, there will be times when the youth go out to eat, but God will want you to stay behind and pray. There comes a time we have to get desperate with God. I want to say that again. There comes a moment. There comes a time that we have to get desperate with God. You see, there is no incense without fire. And there is no prayer without flame. I'll say it again. There is no incense without fire. And there is no prayer without the flame. Ordinate desire is the basis of unceasing prayer. Ordinate desire is the basis of unceasing prayer. It's not a shallow, fickle tendency, but a strong yearning, an unquenchable desire that glows hot and fixes the heart. That's what I'm talking about here. It's the desire that burns its way to the throne room of God. You see, right now, I am reminded in Revelations chapter 8. I want to quickly turn there. Revelations chapter 8. And notice what it says. A great silence filled all heaven, penetrating everything for about half an hour. Then I saw seven heavenly messengers. The one who stands before God receives seven trumpets. An eighth messenger came and stood before the altar. Notice it was the eighth messenger. Eight meaning new beginnings. He, an eighth messenger came and stood before the altar carrying a golden censer. He received the Lord portion of incense to commit the prayer, complete the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that sits in front of the throne. Notice where this golden altar sits. It's in front of the throne of God. From the hand of the eighth messenger, the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's people and billowed up before God. You see, without fire, the incense cannot 
be ignited and move into the atmosphere, permeate the atmosphere. There has to be fire that lights the incense. And desperation becomes the fire that lights the spiritual incense that goes before the throne of God. It is that relentless attitude. It is that do or die prayer that becomes the fire that lights the incense that goes before the throne room of God. And it said it billowed before God. The messenger filled the incense with fiery coals from the altar and cast it upon the earth, causing a great commotion of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightnings, and an earthquake. What is this telling us? It is telling us that there is a group of people that became relentless in their praying. That as I have said before, so say I again. That for them, it was do or die. It was now or never. It was an unstoppable, insatiable. It just consumed them. That they had to have an answer to their prayer. That it became that type of prayer. That it lit the altar. And their prayers became a spiritual incense. And it moved up before the throne room of God. And the angel took that and slapped it upon the earth. And there were commotions. There was thunders. There was lightnings. I truly believe, and I have said this before, that relentless prayer, that deep, incessant prayer shakes things. In the atmosphere, it shakes things within the spiritual realm of God. Things are shifted. Things are moved. Things are gotten out of the way in a relentless, deep desire, that do or die type prayer. And hear what I'm saying. Once again, it is a strong yearning. It is an unquenchable desire. It's the desire that burns its way to the throne room of God. You see, when Jacob held on and continued wrestling, it showed clearly this depth and strength of spiritual desire. I'll say it again. When Jacob held on, when the angel said, let me go, and he said, I will not let you go, until my prayer is answered. It was that tipping point. That when he continued to hold on. It showed clearly to the angel of God. Jacob's depth and strength of spiritual desire. This wrestling only intensified his desire. The urgency of our desire will hold us to the thing desired with a relentless determination that refuses to be lessened or loosened. It will stay. It will plead. It will persist. And it refuses to let go until the answer is given. Because there is no successful prayer without consuming fire. Hear what I'm saying. There is no successful prayer without consuming fire. Once again, I'm talking about the urgency of our desire. If there is an urgency of our desire, it was that way for Jacob at Jabbok that night. His desire wasn't just a desire, but that desire became desperate. There was an urgency to his prayer. It was an urgency, as I've already said numerous times, of do or die. It's now or never for him. And so the urgency of our desire will hold us to the thing desired with a relentless determination that refuses to be lessened or loosened. It will stay. It will plead. It will persist. And it refuses to let go until the answer is given. Because as I've already said, there is no successful prayer without the consuming fire. And I want to just stop right here and say, maybe it's time for you to have a wrestling match with God. I'll say it again. Maybe it's time for you to have a wrestling match with God. 
This is how this teaching came about this morning. This past Thursday, I had a wrestling match with God. There were some things, God, that I told God I was tired of dealing with. In deep prayer, I entered a deep intercession of prayer. And it was in during that moment that I was letting God know that I was a couple of things that I was tired of dealing with. I told God I didn't want to be pacified. I didn't want to be appeased. I didn't want to be humored. I needed him to change some things. And in my desperation, I cried out to God and I wasn't going to stop. For me, it was my tipping point. Maybe it's time for you to have your tipping point in prayer. Oh my God, hear what I am saying. God moved upon me this past Thursday in prayer and gave me this teaching for somebody that yes, you have been praying, but at the same time, what you have been praying about, you have not seen it happen. But I want to go back and say again, that I have learned in my walk with God. Yes, there are times that prayers that uh, are answered quickly. There are times that breakthrough comes mightily fast. But yet at the same time, there are some miracles that do not happen at an instant. There are some breakthroughs that, new, that do not take place at an instant. There are some Answers to prayer that do not happen quickly. And it is in those moments that desperation, if we want it bad enough, that desperation must take hold of us. And we are willing, we have to be willing to wrestle with God. We have to be willing to grapple with God. And as I said, in my desperation, I cried out to the Lord. And I wasn't going to stop. As I said, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in being pacify. I told the Lord, I said, I'm not interested in being pacified. I am not interested in being appeased. I'm not interested in being humored. I need an answer. I need an answer to these prayers. And when I said, God, where are you in this? I felt the Lord speak to me in a very soft voice and said, I am right here. I am right here. I want to tell somebody God is right there. God is right there, but it is time, maybe it's time for you to become so desperate that you grapple with God in prayer, that you wrestle with him in prayer until there's a breakthrough, until there's an answer, until there is a miracle, until your family is saved. You see, maybe it's time for a spiritual wrestling match. Some breakthroughs, as I've already said, some breakthroughs, some miracles, some blessings won't come until you wrestle with God. As I've already said, maybe it's time for a wrestling match. It all depends. Here's the point. It all depends on how bad you want that breakthrough, how bad you want that miracle, how bad you want that blessing, because there is no breakthrough in prayer without a consuming fire, without a consuming fire. You see, I have come to realize in my spirit and in my times of prayer and studying that we are living in a time. Just recently, just several days ago, I read in the news that this generation is falling away from prayer. They're falling away from God. They're no longer attending church. There is no spiritual desire to reach up and take hold of God. And I, it has disturbed me because there's never been a time that we need to get a hold of God as it is right now, right now. The scripture says, and I am talking to people that you know this, the latter house shall be greater than the former. That tells me that in the midst of the great falling away that Paul prophesied would happen in the last days, and we are seeing that now, I just read it several days ago, even more, that there is a great falling away in this generation than ever before in other generations. And so therefore, in order for the latter house to be greater than the former, 
that is letting me know that there is a remnant of people that for them, that they are going to be determined to wrestle with God in prayer until they get the breakthrough. There's going to be people that are going to rise up and be determined. In my prayer this past Thursday, I told the Lord, I said, God, you had 12 disciples. And there, those 12 was what is called the inner circle. But yet, I have learned through many years of studying, there was an inner circle within the inner circle. There was three, Peter, James, and John. They received, or they were allowed, or invited into a place that the other disciples were not privy to. They experienced things that the other were not privy of experiencing. And the Lord made no bones about it. He did not come down the mountain of transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they saw things that, out, that was just outstanding they were, it affected them in such a way that after Jesus rose from the dead and went back up into heaven, years later, Peter was still remembering it when he said, we were eyewitnesses of what happened on the mountain. It was an experience that Peter never forgot. You see, let me stop right here and say, we are living in a time to where we need an experience with God that will shake us. We need an experience with God that will cause us to move into a place of spirituality, of dedication and consecration that we have never obtained before. It is high time, which means before the time. We need a move of God. We need a move of God. You need a move of God that will shake you in a way that you've never been shook before. You need a move of God that will cause you to be an eyewitness of something that will that will change you for the rest of your life. And it is the desire of God to move and show you things that you've never seen before. But yet, as I stated, it will only come when we are willing to wrestle with God. We are willing to grapple with God and let God know in prayer, God, I have read in your word and you've told me this, and you've told me that. You have said that call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you have never seen before, that you have never been an eyewitness to. And in that prayer of desperation, you cry out to God, and you say, God, I come to you now, and I am getting a hold of that word that I am calling upon you. I'm doing exactly what you said, the call unto you call unto you, and that I will be an eyewitness of things that I've never seen before. You've also told me, God, that if I call to you in prayer, you will answer. That if I stand on your word, that I will see the miracle. I will feel the breakthrough. And you that's how you grapple with God in the deepest prayer, in that time of intercession, because the type of prayer that I'm talking about, as I've said earlier, it's not something that's shallow and fickle. It's not a lay me down type of sleep prayer. But no, like Jacob, you get to a place to where it's do or die. You get to a place to where you say that as I begin this prayer, that something has got to change in the midst of it. Something has got to change. There has to be a breakthrough in this prayer. In this prayer, this prayer, this time, not tomorrow, not when I go to bed, but as I am praying at this moment, there has to be a point that there's a breakthrough. There has to be a point to where I receive the answer. There has to be a point to where there's a miracle that is obtained. There has to be a point to where there is salvation that is released. That's the type of prayer that I'm talking about. That's what I mean when I say maybe it's time for somebody to start wrestling with God. Maybe it's time, maybe it's time to where you have your own tipping point. Because God, many years ago, my dad preached about Jacob, and he titled it, An Angel Looking for a Fight. There was, is it possible that there is an angel? There is an eighth angel that is waiting. There is an angel that is waiting to take hold of your prayer and then throw it back in the earth. Maybe there is an angel that's waiting for that wrestling, that grappling with God, 
that you get to that place to where your prayers become so desperate, so desperate that the angel says, now it is this type of prayer that I can take hold of. It is this type of prayer that is igniting the fires of the altar. And I am going to start shifting things and moving things that in this type of prayer, you begin to speak out the, the, the anointing. You begin to speak out the words of God. You begin to speak out that eternal word of God in such a way that you've not spoken it out before. That there's a fire within your spirit when you say, thus saith the Lord. That there is a fire in your spirit when you shout out to God that I am going to be relentless. I'm not letting you go until there is a breakthrough, until there is a miracle release, until there is a, a salvation that's been wrought to my family, to my loved ones, until, until, oh my God, is it possible that there's an angel right now that is waiting, waiting for somebody to become so desperate that it's a tipping point. It is a tipping point in your life that you say that I am not going to get up off of my knees. I am taking my watch off. I am forgetting the time. I am putting everybody to bed. I'm going into the other part of the house. And if it takes all night, I'm going to grapple with God. I am going to grapple with God. Because when the sun rose that morning, Jacob had his answer. Jacob had his breakthrough. God changed his life in a way that he was never the same out uh, from that day forward. Oh, it is a type of prayer. That's why I am challenging somebody to grapple with God. That's why I keep saying maybe it's time for you to start wrestling with God. That God will change you. That you need a change in a way that you've never felt that change before. I am calling. God is calling for you. God's waiting for that wrestling match. He's waiting for that wrestling match. He's waiting for that determination to be ignited within your spirit. Get within your spirit. Don't take what comes. Don't just sit down and take what comes. Go after God. Go after God. As we read in the book of Matthew, that the kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Or forceful men, forceful women, Lay hold on it. Lay hold on it. It's like blind Bartimaeus when the crowd tried to get him to shut up. But the Bible says that he cried even louder. In other words, he knew at that time it was the tipping point in his life. It was do or die. He felt like if I don't get it now, I'll never get it again. And so he became desperate in his crying out. He was grappling with God. He was grappling with God. And believe it or not, that's what got God, Jesus, his attention. That's why he stopped. Because somebody in that crowd was grappling with God. Somebody in that crowd was wrestling with God. And he turned and he said, bring that man to me. And watch this. Blind Bartimaeus, he was identified as a beggar because he had a certain cloak. That was given to him. That rectified him. That it spoke. He was sanctioned as a beggar. And no doubt. There were probably a few coins. That was on his lap. But when he heard the call of God. He threw that aside. No doubt the change that he had. Went flying across the ground. And he got up. And he made his way to where Jesus was. And he got his answer. And he never went back to the place that he was. Oh my God. That's another thing that I am talking about. Don't go back to the way it was. Don't go back to the way it was. Get a desperation within your spirit. Start wrestling with God for a change. And that when God does change you, you won't go back to the way it was. You won't go back to your old mindset. You won't go back to listening to those negative voices. And if need be, you won't go back to the same so-called friends. And here was another example. There was this woman that had the issue of blood for many, many years. Twelve years. Oh, my God. How many people am I talking to that you've got an issue? 
you've got an issue, you've got something that you have been carrying, dealing with for a very long time. The scripture says that according to that time, that because of her condition, she was an outcast. She was considered unclean. She could not go to the temple and have a relationship with God. They did not allow it at that time. But because of her desperation, and she had tried, the scripture says, she had tried everything. She went to every kind of doctor, and she had spent everything that she had to where she had no more money to fall back on. She did not have a husband that would take care of her. She did not have a son that maybe would take care of her. It was all her. But she did not wait for Jesus to make his way to her. The scriptures does not tell us how far she had to walk to, in her weakened condition. No doubt that there were several times that she had to stop and sit down and take her breath, catch her breath. But yet she would get back up. And she finally, when she got to where Jesus was, there was a throng of people that was there. And she came from behind the press. The word press in the Greek means a throng of people. So it was not easy for her to make her way through that throng because there was other people there that was wanting a touch. But here's my point. Out of all the thronging, there was one where Jesus said, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And the Peter and them, they said, how do you know? How can you tell? Because there's so many people around you. But watch this. Heaven knew somebody just wrestled with God. Somebody grappled with God. It was a do or die moment. They were showing a desperation that all the others were not showing. And so she, Jesus turned. And when she saw that it was him, then she admitted it. And God killed her completely. Oh, my God. I have said so many times when we have gathered together in worship in a church service, that every service, there's always going to be that one person that is going to grapple with God in the midst of the service. It might be during the worship service. It might be during when we're taking up offering time. It might be as the preaching is going forth. But there's going to be that one, just like that woman. There's going to be that one, that one Bartimaeus, that is going to say, it's my tipping point time. It's my time that I'm going to get my breakthrough in this service. I'm not leaving this service without a miracle. I'm not leaving this service without a breakthrough. Let me talk to somebody here this morning. You need, you need that desperation. You need that desperation because the Bible says that in the Old Testament that God was going to go through Jerusalem and he was going to bring judgment on everyone that was settled on their lees. It also says about Moab that they in their youth had been not emptied from vessel to vessel. Therefore, their taste remained in them. There was no change. There was no desire. I am talking to somebody that you have, you have been just coasting with God and you think it's all right with God. That is not. That is the lie of the devil. That's the lie of the devil because we find that we're, God put it in his word that his kingdom is suffering with violence and forceful, forceful men and women. They grab a hold of it. They laid hold of it. It's do or die. They realize, I've got to grab it. I've got to run after it. I've got to chase after it. I've got to get it now. It is right now. So I challenge you that's been kind of sitting back on your spiritual lees. you just been kind of coasting with God. And the enemy has made you believe that God is okay with that. As I've just used some scriptures, God is not okay with that. The devil has told you a lie. God he wants to ignite the fires of enthusiasm of going after him once again. But it has to be you. It has to be you. It has to be you. You have to get to a place like Jacob to where he just pushed everybody. He said, you go on ahead. You go on ahead. And he was there left alone. There are moments that you've got to get away from the crowd. As I said earlier, you got to get away from the crowd. You got to get away from the clamor. You got to get alone with God. You've got to be determined 
that I need that breakthrough now. I need that miracle now. I need a touch from God now. God, I'm not talking about next week. I'm not talking about in the morning, but I'm talking about right now. It's a tipping point in my life, God. It is a tipping point in my life. I pray that I have been talking to somebody right now that through this teaching that there has been a spark that has reignited your spirit that when this is over with, that, that sometime during the, this afternoon or during the week, you get along with God. You, As I said, you get away from time. You get away from people. And you crawl in to make you a prayer room. Build you an altar. And there is a determination within you. When you get down on your knees, that there's a determination within you. That God, I am here. I am not talking about a tomorrow breakthrough. I am not talking about a miracle tomorrow. I'm talking about a breakthrough before I get up off my knees. Before I get up off my knees, I need the miracle. I need the answer. Time to wrestle with God. Time to grapple with God. Time to grapple with God. That's waiting. He's waiting for a wrestling match. He's waiting for a wrestling match. He's waiting for somebody to approach him that he releases the answer now. He releases the miracle now. He releases the breakthrough now. Now, 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 now. Right now. Right now. Are you willing to have a wrestling match with God? Are you willing? Are you willing? Is there a spiritual hunger? Is there a spiritual desire? Because without the flame, without the intensity of desire, there will be no flame lit. There has to be an intensity of desire. Don't be a part of the generation today that's turning their back on God. Be the generation. Be the circle within the circle. Be the inner circle within the inner circle. And I say again, maybe it's time for a wrestling match. Until next time, keep your head up, keep your knees bent, keep looking up, and remember, remember, the quails have arrived. God richly bless you. Wrestle with God and get your answer.